personally like anybody who makes an effort. I'm just so sick of tracksuits and so sick of the Aussie dressing down, scared to be noticed. I'm just so bored. I mean, and fat Aussie physiques and fat blue, two-tone blue polyester tops. I just think how, you know, they're the ones that should have a look at themselves. ideas quickly and ruthlessly and you could not be quite so uh, precious and rarefied about yourself. We organised meetings and we had you know a couple of hundred people come along to the CV ballroom to discuss what we should do and the idea was that we form a council and Peter Corrigan, who is a, a Melbourne architect, said, well, you know, don't, don't, play, uh, don't play it safe. You know, go to the top and call yourself the Fashion Design Council of Australia. You know, really show those, really show those smug old bastards what can happen. Who says fashion sucks? And I came back at the end of 72 and Whitlam had got in. And I stayed because Whitlam was interested in the arts and... Uh, one could, there was just a feeling in the air, people were hungry, people were, you know, it, it, creativity was exploding. I'd, I'd lived in the most creative place in the world uh, for seven years and uh, I wanted to be part of that change. Well, so in the late 70s, you had a really important blurring of the boundaries between what was fashion, what was art and what was craft. And a lot of people came out of a visual arts background and were putting that into fashion. So I think it was very important from that point of view that that was a really a renaissance time for things in Australia as far as creative input was concerned. So I decided I'd do an exhibition about this and it was the first sort of major exhibition in a public art gallery on dress and a few people were bewildered by the fact that there were frocks. Other curators refer to it as the Big Jane's Frock Show, but it had tremendous impact. happened in Melbourne in 1983 as a, as a direct result of people like Jenny Bannister and, um, and, 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 and the influence of Peter Tully going back to Melbourne and really um, causing a major explosion um, ten years later. This exhibition had made art, art clothes a serious proposition in Australia. The major costume and decorative arts collections in Australia had all come to it and purchased for their collections and had given us all names and it spurred me on, I know, to go even further, to push the boundaries right out. It started out as a fairly grungy period with, um, you know, like the obvious sort of figures of Nick Cave and, um, and uh, the boys next door people that were getting very much into the punk aesthetic, which, I, you know, sort of came from London rather than anywhere else, but developed into a sort of St Kilda push or a Clifton Hill push. The same thing was happening in art, uh, where people like Philip Brophy and Maria Kozik and folk like that were at the Clifton Hill Music Centre producing videos and 
performances and strange things. There were a gallery called Art Projects in Melbourne, which uh, produced sort of grunge art. Uh, all of this was produced without a commercial sort of sensibility, more a sense of energy and a feeling that, okay, the mainstream isn't interested, so we'll do it anyway. Said he had this band. We went along to see the band, and uh, up on stage they were all dressed in black, they were all drunk, and they were singing, These Boots Are Made for Walking. And I remember sort of standing there in kind of post hippie clothes, because that's sort of what we picked up on, realizing that there was this whole thing out there. So uh, we adopted it while they were doing the music, we adopted it in a fashion sense. We were all out trying to buy um, fishnet tops and plastic trousers and putting safety pins through our ears. So in a sense, we weren't making a statement so much about um, anarchy or anything like that. It was like, wow, here's this fantastic fashion look. And look how easy it is to create when you could go out and get all the op shop things. The fact that it was possible to make your own clothes and it was possible to also make your own music meant that you could create a large part of your own lifestyle um, in your own living room. And that gave people an enormous sense uh, of control of their lives. It was, it was possible to step outside of what was being offered by um, status quo organisations and create your own culture. The uh, two major parades that preceded the Fashion Design Council's establishment were really Fashion 82 and Fashion 83. And they were organised by a group called Party Architecture, uh, Gillian Burt and Julie Purvis. And as the name implies, the events or the parades were really more about having fun. They weren't really serious fashion events. And uh, Julie and um, Gillian had a program on Triple R called Bitches and Pieces. And they recruited uh, Robert Pierce, who was a graphic designer at the time, to put together the look for the show. Would everyone, Would everyone please, please be still, still and give a big, big round of applause, applause to the most, most exciting, exciting and diverse, diverse presentation, presentation of fashion, fashion ever seen in Australia. Australia. And it happens to be in Melbourne, that's right, as Party Architecture presents Fashion 1983. Who says fashion, 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 fashion sucks? Who says fashion sucks? <laughs> Uh, and so, in a way, you had people at that stage moving into fashion design like you had people moving into music. Uh, a lot of the people involved came through art school. And I got them to lift the girls and carry them around as though they were just, you know, manhandling a few bits of sculpture. And. I was very, very pleased with the whole idea, you know, I'd really made a statement. It wasn't a fashion parade, this was an art happening. And the whole parade was like that. And it, had a, it was an amazing influence on me because I, I saw clothes that um, I'd never sort of seen before. It was more like sort of, um, it wasn't fashion, it was sort of like art that um, uh, I felt really in, in, in touch with and I, it was just something that I found really exciting. So. Well, I think that Robert Pierce particularly understood how important it was to make a public spectacle out of this work as a way of giving it a cultural profile because then as now most of this work was completely ignored by the mainstream press. If you're at all interested in fads and fashion, and who isn't these days, then check out On Mass. On Mass is news, views and interviews with Australia's own glamorous life, plus the ID magazine report hot from London and all the relevant... That's what I think about Australians, and I can have that. They hunch over and, and want to pass unnoticed. They all wear brown, or all wear blue, or all wear grey, and they, they would rather you not look at them. 
But I, I, I think that's unnatural, really. The FTC was set up in 1983 with a small grant from the Victorian Ministry for the Arts uh, in Melbourne. Uh, and the grant was $3,000, which enabled us to set up a office of sorts. And in early 1984, we held a number of small shows. And then at the end of 1984, we held our first big parade, Fashion 84. Fashion 84 was incredible. Um, I mean, we didn't really, in some respects, we didn't really know what it was all going to be like. You had an enormous number of people all drawn together, all making clothes. The backstage was frenetic. There were makeup artists everywhere. There were dresses everywhere. There were hairdressers. I mean, everyone was going mad. Um, everything was going wrong. Everything was going right. And then the lights came on. The models started coming out. And for a moment I was able to get a break and have a look at what it looked like from the front. And it just looked incredible. And I was all young and secure and hadn't come across anything like this before in my life. And I felt like I had a little family and that I was needed and wanted. And, and there was an excuse because I was so dressed up and there was suddenly an excuse, you know, to be dressed up. You could get away with it because there was a big parade on and, and you were sort of, people accepted you more. They did a similar sort of thing in London. It was never on the scale that it was in Melbourne. It was never to, the ones overseas never included people that perhaps made things up in their back room, you know, someone like um, Peter Zagouris. Yeah. 